Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Royal Drawing School's uh, Creative Conversation Series. Uh, tonight, I'm really delighted to welcome um, in conversation the artist Mandy El Sayer and curator Karine Harmond. They will explore Mandy's multifaceted artistic practice, taking in the tension between abstraction and creating meaning in her work as it manifests in the entanglement of painting, drawing and writing. They'll also address her video and performance works and how they relate to subjects of violence, physical body and processes of care. So I'd like to just introduce uh, our speakers a little further. Mandy um, El Sayer um, is a London-based artist whose process-driven practice is rooted in an ex exploration of material and language. In her paintings, her table vitrines, immersive installations and videos, she, she creates uh, layered anthologies of found text and images. Her previous solo exhibitions have included uh, Sersuk Museum in Beirut, Betten Salon in Paris in France, Chisenhill Gallery in London, Lehman Malkin in Hong Kong, um, and the Mistake Room in Guadalajara in Mexico. And next year, um, she'll be featured in the British Art Show, the largest touring exhibition of contemporary art in the UK. Mandy will be talking with Karine Harmond, who is uh, the Assistant Curator of International Art at Tate Modern in London. She is uh, also a trustee of Mimosa House, uh, also based in London, a space uh, dedicated to platforming women and queer artists and focusing on the fluidity of identity. Her pre previous curatorial projects have included working in Cameroon, in Mozambique and in South Africa. And she was co-curator um, on the exhibition, I am Ash Banapal, King of the World, King of Syria at the British Museum in 2016. She also holds an MA in archaeology and curatorial studies from the School of the Louvre in Paris and an MA in modern and contemporary art history and theory from the University of Essex. So welcome to you both and thanks for, for joining us this evening. And um, of course, just to remind all the, uh, everyone listening in the audience that you're, as usual, welcome to leave questions or comments um, in the chat box or the Q&A box and we'll, we'll come back to those um, at the end of the conversation. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you. Um, I will, let me just share my screen because I have a presentation um, prepared. Can everyone see it? Yep, yep, that, that's coming up. Perfect, yeah. Okay, great. Um, So yes, thank you so much. I first, just just give me a second, because actually when I share my screen, then I lose your faces actually. And it will be strange to have an in conversation with Mandy without seeing you. Um, Sorry, that's. Um... Yeah, we've got the. the okay, now it's fine. Now I can see you. <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks for being patient. Um, yeah, I just wanted to start by saying that I, I first came across your uh, work, uh, Mandy, at your show at the Chisholm uh, in 2019. And then I think we met really um, kind of a bit after that at Freeze. And then I visited your studio with my colleague from Tate, Nabila. And then COVID happened, um, which was a rupture for everyone, I think. Um, but that studio visit that uh, we had really stayed with me. And so when Claudia invited me to do this conversation, I thought it would be just really um, great to do it with you because there's so many uh, fascinating topics to unpack in your work and also I think you have a very generous way to bring people into your work um, which makes this um, format of in conversation even more meaningful uh, especially in that in this context of the drawing school so yeah thank you so much um, for accepting thank that. You. Thank you everyone uh, for turning up and organizing um, yeah that that studio visit was great and it's almost like we could continue for hours. So it'd be good to like <laughs> focus, focus it a bit 
because we can go off in a million different tangents. Yeah, definitely. And I just wanted to start um, here talking about um, your painting practice. And we'll also be talking later about, um, I mean, I'll show an animation that you've made for the British Archer as well. And we'll talk um, about that in your recent video and performance work. But starting with your um, painting practice, you, so at the show in, at Chisenail, you are featuring some of these net grid paintings, which are these very large scale paintings that you do that are an ongoing series. And I'm sure like we can see one of them actually behind you now. Um, and they're also kind of assemblages and collages. And as you can see here, this is a detail of one of them. Um, you integrate in them like these bits of like newspapers and magazines, but also different layers of uh, paint. And I just was wondering if we could start by you telling us about um, the layering work that you do in these paintings and how, how it came to be. Mm. Well, I wanted like a format that I didn't need to think about and didn't need to shift. So I could see like the variation of time. So they're always the same kind of uh, size, the same kind of impulse and just thinking about languages of legitimacy and a painting that's a grid I mean that's pretty you know recognizable because I, I always struggle to call myself a painter I always saw myself as a draftsman someone who draws and if you look closely they're like a lot of it is like just one single line hardly like a third of it is done with a paintbrush but normally that they're, they're, they're drawings they're essentially really large-scale drawings um, and the paint allows for like a kind of very impasto type of collage, but you could be doing it on paper, let's say. Um, so I wanted to think of, again, these ideas of like legitimacy in, in like in culture, which is the painting part. And then this writing process of like opacity and transparency. So everything is, is, is there, but there's a kind of like resistance to, to reading or seeing fully. So like you're, you're looking at it as a painting, but then you're also reading like the individual fragments. So thinking about figure ground in so many different ways, like a grounded reality and a kind of formal relationship with like, um, you know, composition, color and, and things like that. And always flitting between the two of like this kind of transcendental space um, and this kind of base level stuff or shit or abjectness that can mm. go in. So trying to find a language where I could not pick between the two and be allowed to have that in between space. Yeah. Um, really, they just end up in that in that kind of consolidated body. But if you look at the practice, we're here in the painting studio part, but there's another part where I just collect stuff. It's a quite scattered, messy, disjointed uh, practice. So this is a way to like hold the body, you know? Yeah, and I was thinking about that, actually, that's the first time we went to your studio and I was really struck by, by all of the things you collect and you have like all these boxes and trays full uh, and full of things, uh, which are the newspapers, etc, but also all kind of objects and, um, and so I was seeing these paintings as maybe a way to make sense of it all, because there, there is beauty in the um, accumulation of all these different elements and the kind of uncanniness to it as well that maybe reveals um, reveals meanings. Mm. Um, yeah, that's important to kind of not be too conscious while making, just like being in this like playful space and let the kind of meanings reveal itself through the material or the process. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna quickly like grab something to show you guys. <laughs> I always show this in every studio visit, but I think it's like <laughs> so this is my um, Pantone color chart. So like I literally take um, palette inspo from this thing. There's always kind of these bruisey tones with this pinkiness. And so like there's this kind of direct relationship to this um, fleshiness. So like, if you don't mention that, like you can just think, oh, like someone said, oh, they're really feminine or they're really seasonal or whatever. But 
that actually I'm actually looking like bruised tones and like tissue slippage and and things like that yeah um, it can be both like gross and and pretty at the same time <laughs> and I think that's why um because yeah, it's true like there's something very visceral about it all and it's you know colors of wounded flesh or or bruises as you say and I feel like visiting your studio there is something very uh, kind of anthropophagic about it it feels like you are being eaten by it all and you find yourself in What's a body <laughs> what does that mean and so it means that you're eating uh, a human anthropophagic human and then phag oh, phagic yeah. eating oh, like how the cells uh, so, so yeah it's kind of cannibal it's cannibalism Basically. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh, totally. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I feel like you really feel that when you're in your studio, you just are in a body and there's something quite um, violent to it, but also something very comforting, like a baby being, mm. you know, in a belly, for example. Um, I love and that I, description. I think that's how I really feel. Like this lack of separation is unhealthy, as people have said, like you need to get out. But at the same time, it's like, warming like I always nest or like find a corner to sleep in or something you know so there's this thing of like it feeding itself like it's self-feeding um, yeah being an in internal space yeah um, so yeah, I really and, like that um, description <laughs> and I was just wondering like thinking about that aspect of violence but also comfort there was this other I have some other images um here are other of your works and not, not your net grid paintings, but even these other paintings all have this palette, really strong palette. And that's from um, your exhibition that you had in Beirut in 2019. And again, you, you do have this feeling of being you know, ab absorbed in it. And, and with that, you were showing this really great film, The Amateur, um, which is a video work that superimposes um, shots of a... Um, so one part of it is a video that shows a, a body of someone who was killed, uh, who was shot. And you kind of see these um, gunshot wounds, uh, but also it's just like very zoomed in. And you put on the side of it these very abstract paintings. And I was just wondering, how do you kind of navigate that um, violence, but at the same time, um, this more aesthetic aspect is there. Do, do, would you speak about like, an aesthetic of violence in your work? For sure. Like I wanted to, like it's it was footage taken from um, Latin America of this young person that was killed in a um, cartel uh, clash, like 18 or something. And this was in the morgue when they're dressing the body ready for the uh, ceremony. And I thought I was going to do life drawing because I, I kind of follow these groups that do uh, death life drawing or like medical anatomists, sometimes artists. Um, and I cropped it so that there was this point of like, of where you couldn't recognize what was happening. So there's, there's movement. And on that left side is like found images on Google of or like the Rothkos, Richters, and another abstract expressionist I forgot that's really big. Like that's how bad my memory retention is for like these things that I should remember. But um, And the kind of, so the relationship are these kind of rudimental, uh, rudimentary um, color relationships or strokes or kind of marks and thinking about that slippage between the two and this kind of, this space of high culture that rarefies non-representation and this other space in living in a body where you cannot escape that figuration um so like and how that can go into another space because there's a point of me looking at this body and i thought there's no way i can draw how can i draw right now when this dude is taking out his insides and it was just like there was like this kind of disjointed relationship and I didn't know what I was looking at exactly because all the kind of tissue had just, it's just like just meshed into one kind of plane, you know, it was just texture. It wasn't, there was no objectivity anymore. So you could almost call that a point of abstraction that you're just in this place, the cyclical space that was just overwhelming the kind of, there wasn't differentiation between anything and you were engulfed in this, in this kind of, 
very full and empty space. Full as in like a lot was happening. There's a lot of color and things, but empty as like it felt like death, empty, like cold, you know? Um, and I could almost be talking about the abstract expressionist when I describe that. So I kind of describe my practice as a almost hysterical one in the sense that I do not want to dismiss this body, this grounded reality, this um, centered, this point that I start from. I d like, I don't want to literally don't want to step over the body to get to the painting. I want you to acknowledge that body. Yeah. As, as you're seeing the painting, not before you get to it, not like it's a stage above it, but it's actually with with abstraction. That's how I can how I conceptualize abstraction, almost like a forcible removal, like a ab, like subtraction of yeah. something. So I want to kind of re-embed it. It's like you think of the grids as like a in fleshing or a yeah, it's more sculptural. Like I see like the thickness of like the painting. Like I see that as like a slab of flesh. Like that's like um, corn beef, you know? And that's why they need to be like in series so you can get a set, a more visceral sense of them. Um, like I don't like them actually when I see them in pictures when it's just that one plane. Yes. I see them more embodied. And that's really interesting that, um, that you see your work as uh, as something that is embodied like that, especially in your painting work, but also when we, um, when we went to your studio, you were showing us these um, drawings, like many very intricate drawings that you were do doing and that you presented as like doodling. And um, as opposed to your paintings that have all of this thickness to them, this is something like a practice that is very flat. Um, I, was, I wanted to show uh, a bit of it. Is that something? Are you happy to do that, Mandy? Because I think that yeah, animation really, it, it really deserves to be seen. Um, You say it. You say that you did that, and then and then he says, if if I said it, I would I would heal, but I can't say it. So you say it, and then he says, please don't be shy. Don't don't be frightened of me getting angry. Just say it, and he says that you you you're saving me from my um life from from my my fabricated dreams, my fake dreams. My dreams were fake, and and my and my emotions were like so extreme. Like you're you're saving me. And I saw that you that you were a chain that I didn't want to break, so you broke it. Yeah. And, and then and then okay. And then he says, and I saw you as a sin that I asked God not to forgive, so you forgave it. <gasps> what is it called? Um, La Tekmili. In English? Don't lie. Don't lie. Don't lie. Yeah, I know. I get that. Yeah. But they still. It's still like majority of the population all the time, you know? So when you deal with, the reason why I don't like it, it's not because of them. It's more the other way around. It's more, that's why I can't gain their trust. I have to remove the power. It's, like, it's just like, I feel what the, actually I feel as though they are feeling me. That's amazing. Yeah, it's like, I don't know why. But have you always had that talent of like having empathy with plants or 
animals. Uh, yeah. So I will oh. stop it here. Um, just to continue our discussion. It's it's really great to see this work. It's so like hypnotizing and you just end up yeah being lost in itself. Um virtually it's interesting talking about like hypnotizing because the I mean you you mentioned these kind of very intricate ways of drawing as doodling and it's it is something of it is an automatic technique, something that you kind of do without really thinking about it, that Freud explored as a kind of releasing of the subconscious. Um, he was using automatic drawing in his um, in his therapy sequences, uh, for example. And I was wondering if that kind of releasing of the uh, unconscious was one of the reasons you doodle like that. Who are you referring to just now? Uh, Sigmund Freud. I was saying oh, Freud. That, that he was. Oh. Yeah. Okay, because uh, Henry Michel, I think he like would take masculine and do. A bunch of like ink stuff and actually yeah. weirdly enough it's not that romantic where i'd say like the unconscious is released i i'm interested in ideas of automism but actually it like these are my earliest works before the grid so it takes a while actually to get that signature so i was like trying to understand the patterning of like um parquet herringbone pattern thinking about so initially it started like it's exactly what you said i wanted something super flat i was thinking about the digital blue of like um windows microsoft at that time so the way that blue is projected on screen with light so i wanted to create a drawing that was totally analog but that could have the feeling of like there's light it's lit within just from the ground so so again the relationship to a figure ground drawing on the ground um and this light because it, it's so detailed eventually like it has this kind of opacity so the so one can talk about that very formally in terms of like it's like the antithesis of the flesh, right? And it's this kind of flattening of a surface. It's thinking about light, it's thinking about form, and it's thinking about tone, tone and things. And then the conceptual part, or the, the kind of material conceptual part would be the idea of writing, the idea of the body writing itself, the idea of this, the automism comes in then. Like you do things enough times, like you say you do things a hundred times, it almost gets written into you. It gets written into like, what they say muscle memory or like exercise memory or things like that so i did that once you do this like across this square it starts having its own rules so mm -hmm. like once it a certain curve something will happen one blah 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 so if you if i added i thought this is the first time i properly added specific text to it it distorts that growth like a petri dish would if there's different bacteria introduced into the agar jelly so I was thinking about this kind of erasure of documents historically and then trying to put that into a drawing process. And at the time I was like, you know, going through a really bad time, you know, BLM was happening and um, thinking about like this kind of erasure. And there's this a section about BDS in the 2016 edition of the manifesto. And I was trying to find it online and I was getting really quite um, frustrated that I couldn't find it anywhere and I couldn't source it or cite it but eventually I did find it in a pdf and I wanted to literally record it so the same way that I, I think all my work is like kind of recording my body and in it is rhythmic sense I wanted to record this fragment and kind of embed it and have it in this texture almost and almost thinking of thinking through writing through this process, what happens to certain fragments, what happens to certain things, how, how things can disappear with an overlayering or a flattening. And that yeah. flattening is a violent one, even though it can look, you know, transcendent at the end. It's like a erasure of some sort. Yeah. So do, do, so do you find that all these um, kind of very covering motifs ends up for you obscuring that message that you are um, writing at the beginning. I think your the writing comes from uh, the American movement of, for Black Lives, right? Yes. Um, so what was it was it a way for you to obscure that aspect? Um, or you want or or actually US than I think yeah. it's like, you know, we were talking about this idea of like solidarity and existing on the same plane. Um, at the same time, and this idea of like, how do you keep something precious? How do you keep something when everything wants it to burn? 
you know. So it's actually a quite reparative one as well, in the sense that, you know, there's there's a kind of strategy or a politic of um, resistance in kind of like obscuring uh, certain things from view. Clandestinity, as we were talking, we use that word. Um, yeah. How can I keep these fragments alive in in a plane without it going through like the censorship machine? Like I just recently did yeah. some paintings from China yeah. and they didn't go through. They were too like in your face, like, you know, I didn't layer them enough. <laughs> so like, um, it's as much a kind of way of being and living as it is drawing or painting. Um, yeah, and I was... Um, I, deserve, I think I deserve to also play with the idea of like, what if I just wanted to just make a nice painting? I'm allowed that too. Like who's allowed abstraction? I'm allowed Exactly, it. why not? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah. why not? Um, I was I was also thinking about you know that really rhizomatic way in which uh, you start from one thing and then from it grows and expands you know in many directions but every shape and every sign is interconnected with each other in the end anyways um, and that made me think about um, ideas around care and radical care obviously your work is really kind of um, that that idea is really intrinsic in your practice because you were talking about you know this uh the fact that you're looking into like fleshy toads and and all of that aspect of your work and i know you you worked before as a social worker as well so so care is something that is part of that and i was thinking about something feminist um activist ina michaeli said uh, about radical care and she kind of opposes that to the individualistic self-care something that is made to treat yourself or you know, monitor your health for an individualistic aim. And she says radical care starts with um, the understanding of the self as grounded in a history, but also in a set of complex relations. And I, I think that really comes up in your work here, that interconnectedness of relations. And here, obviously, relations of violence and vulnerability, because that solidarity uh, and resistance you're referring to is about acting for communities that are oppressed. Um, but also in that there is something very personal that comes up in this work. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't put it the whole for the whole um, time of the of the work, but you, you start hearing voices of people that is you and your friends and family speaking and some of their experiences um, are linked to the systems of oppression that the text addresses, like the occupation of Palestine. And, and so for me, this work really demonstrates these two aspects of solidarity that is at a macro um, scale, um, political, societal, in the public sphere, but also that solidarity is meaningful because it's deeply needed uh, at the personal and emotional level. And I think this is what radical care means, uh, is understanding this dynamic and that relationship between both. Um, and acting and knowing this. And, and I really think that is what comes through um, in, in that work. I was also wondering about the title um, of this work. It's called uh, Windows Live States. Is that, can you tell us why did you choose that title? Yeah, so Windows comes from like the Windows Blue that was exploring the first place. So something that's totally like in that realm of abstraction we we're talking about. So windows being, and also a window into some kind of reality, I guess. Live states would be windows live, like live hotmail. <laughs> and then just states, like, cause there is in a continual state of even evolving. And just thinking about the two states, that's always like a motif that comes in me. Two state solution, what state for and now, that's the grounded um, mm. part of the, of the work. But going back to your ideas of like, interconnectedness and complexity I think yeah that's super important in terms of like how whatever is placed on the ground will determine how and show how things are all connected together because the way we grow as flesh like it's beautiful hearing you talk because I'm hearing your language in your realm of how you understand that connectivity but almost in my kind of like spectrum brain I'm always thinking very biologically and then if I can move past that like almost lego thinking I'm thinking about like my family my immediate family you know say and like my father's illness and if one like with this kidney failure if one 
part of the body is failing, another part will come and help it. Um, and you were talking about the fungi and how like different organisms, they do the same in nature and how things come in place very creatively. And you learn over a few generations of how that repair can happen. And actually this vulnerable body becomes a creative body. It becomes a powerful body despite, despite it's like um, initial weakness, let's say. Um, and all these voices are coming out of a bad time. And I was looking at all my WhatsApp voice notes and thinking about how like class is always so obscured, like especially when we're, you know, we're in the politics of like this, this area of like identity politics right now, you know, and one, the last guy in the end, he's talking about like his, um, his squat, you know, this, this Polish guy that he's friends with Br very briefly, you're know, saying us to move his stuff, just thinking about like how that is the same as my mom talking about like um, coming from like a ex-communist uh, extreme history that, you know, those kind of stories are often like very fetishized as like other. And actually it's on the same plane as, as this guy right at the end when he's talking about moving his bike like out of this place and he, ha he has the stress, you know, on some levels on the same plane. Like, I'm not saying that on all levels, but just trying to think how these connections, how they can be seen, how they can be felt mm -hmm. instead of like be so segregated, you know? And that again links back to the history of like civil rights movements and the solidarity that historically were very present and then we, we forget and they fracture at certain points in history as well. Yeah, and I guess, um... As you were saying, like sometimes it's very present, and we saw that in the past 15 months, how these, you know, um, solidarity movements and liberation movements just became more and more visible for us all uh, through, even though we were in lockdown, actually through uh, our screens and um, and what what we're receiving on on our, on social media, uh, and that really deeply touched and transformed, I think, everyone. Um, so I was, yeah, I was wondering how, um, how that has really impacted um, your practice. It's actually really helped me a lot, you know, it's like made me feel less crazy in my head. Like, cause you know, for so long, I couldn't talk about these things vocally. It's almost like you have to be four steps removed to talk about it. Like you have to be in a safe space to talk about it. Like you have to be like, I don't want to use the word privilege, but you have to be away from it. I can't talk about it with my family in Gaza, you know, in an art space at, at certain point in history because I would lose funding for something or, oh, she's that one, you know, or like the painting would be seen differently. And then, you know, like there's this exclusionary kind of insidious silencing that happens. So when I saw like BLM happening, even though that was like, in the middle of like the worst time and the Palestinian protests, like it was almost like this relief, like a relief for my hystericism. Like it's like, oh, it's real. We can talk about it. Like, oh, like finally it's like somewhat kind of like um, acknowledged. Cause it, it, even though people, you know, we're in art with very small kind of section, like sector, you know, the art world. So we're all like left wing, we're all like pro this and pro that, whatever. But it's not like that. It's not like that living in London. We know what happens to someone that speaks out. Look at Corbyn, you know? So it's like really dangerous in some places. So it kind of ha has relieved me to see all these young people like so vocal, so up with their language. Like I love hearing people speak <laughs> in certain ways. Sometimes like I don't have that language. I have this, that's my language, but I'm also like so, um ignorant to certain like uh specificities of politics and language because it's so close to my um experience it's like i i almost go mute when i approach that level or that proximity to things so like when i can hear other people like do it and and be present and show up it's like it it makes me i'm just stunned you know but at the same time, you also address that uh, in your work, and a work like this one really, really shows that. So I'm, I'm sure for a lot of people, you are that person who kind of articulates these really well, and um, and you also stun other people like that. <laughs> but I wanted to move on to your performance because I know it's already 
36 past. Um, and so, yes, first of all, you send me this image, which is uh, really great and, and has these drawings that you do. And I think that was um, laying the floor. This, is, this was covering the floor when you did this performance in 2020 for Freeze. Um, which I, yeah, I understood uh, only, only later, um, actually. Um, but you were telling me in your studio how before you paint, you actually warm up by dancing um, and in a kind of uh, way you're, you're also thinking about kind of taking space like that. And I was wondering if your work naturally evolved towards performance because of that. No, actually, it didn't. <laughs> like <laughs> this whole thing, whatever, however I can describe it, because it's like draw, it's drawing with bodies in a way. It's still drawing. Um, yeah. Now of like, uh, don't want to sound too dramatic, but it really was out of a mental breakdown. Um, and I knew this deadline was coming up, so it was nice because it gave a channel for like this energy that I had. I stopped making work at the time in 2020 in the studio. We talked about it in depth, but um, <laughs> just to go. To, to the point is like I lost all coordinates of self it was quite um extreme like I couldn't do certain actions I didn't know why I didn't understand what painting was I couldn't even like sit down properly like left or right was confused so like I did know these things I did know about drawing and that work on the floor was the first ever blue piece I did like in school like in art school and I scanned it and I embedded this Winston Churchill quote. So like whatever I saw at the time, it was so loosened in association. Everything could, was like uh, connecting with everything. If I saw someone on the street, it meant this and that. Like, you know, so with, it, with my work and the fragmented nature of it everywhere, like I was just flicking through a book and I found that quote from Winston Churchill talking about the, um, the troops in the um, pilots from, from the war. So he's talking about how those have like served, you know, um, the country. And then thinking about if you take away the context of that and you apply it now, that can apply to these bodies we're talking about, our bodies, you know? So it's just like, you just remove the frame and then you've got like this, again, this fluidity has changed its, its uh, pr um, perspective. So like I started with that, like, so I didn't even know what I was doing for this thing. I just was like picking up bits. And then because I had this weird kind of tick where I couldn't stop moving, I couldn't do anything, but I had to keep, I had to like, I was, I can't explain what it is. It's like a restlessness. I think it's called akathisia. And I was just, all I had was the mirror and like these, these actions came out of this um, bodily distress, let's say. They were started with really simple like motifs, like these taekwondo kind of blocks like this or, um, these positions, because I, I used to do ballet and as, a, as a kid. I went to a really good primary school, lucky me. Um, so like these things came up, so I was piecing them together. So it's not a matter of like what the concept was, it's like how did they come together? Like the manner, the merginess, like if you think of everything, the tissues of connectivity, there's, they're not any one thing. So you could almost look at the performance as a building of like the drawing, it's like, okay, I have this body, I have these actions, I have these motifs. Then more, more kind of like motifs came up. It's like, okay, I have this figure of a doppelganger. How do I protect this person, you know? And then, you know, I kind of ended up using this kind of a bulletproof or the stab proof vest that I made from like magazines. And then put the kind of inscriptions from my father on the front and from my maternal uncle on the back. Um, in Arabic and That's, Chinese, so they're like, yeah, so they're almost like part of the ritual. So they protect the body. They they kind of like, you know, give me good protective energy. Yeah, um, and I was enacting a whole kind of exorcism there of like yeah. this idea. I don't want to go into depth of like this thing, but there's a very personal thing that happened at the time with this person who I believed was my doppelganger, <laughs> and even like even the jacket that was like completely coincidental, like how that came into it. I was. Uh, getting something from Westfield and I saw that jacket in the La Ralph Lauren store in the window it was the only extra small and I didn't have that much money so I had to get my brother to get it but like I was like I need that jacket like because it reminded me of the Averex jackets in school in college when I went to college and and um 
people would get stabbed for it if you wore it in certain areas because it was so coveted. It was a motorcycle leather jacket, blue and red and white with the typical colors. And I thought of that as a really good transitional object, like between me and the other, that there's a standoff of coveting. Like I'm, I'm initially wearing the jacket, I have more. So there's a kind of like giving over, handing over of it to another yeah. body. And just to, um, to kind of tell everyone, because maybe people haven't seen the performance, but um, you can view it on, online. But you basically, you, so you're wearing this stab vest and then on top of that, yeah. at the beginning of it, you're, you're wearing that uh, other jacket. Um, yeah. And you're making some, some movements and you have other performers who come into the space to whom at some point you just yeah. turn to them and you give them the jacket. And then yeah. you go and stop moving and it, the space is theirs and they can yeah. restyle. Yeah. I mean, I can't even watch that performance because I was in such a different headspace. That's why I had the balls or the gumption to do it. Like I'm not a dancer, <laughs> clearly not a dancer. But I had these movements that I, I was so certain about. So in, in the initial part, it was like a patrolling of the street. So I was almost like thinking what it was like to be on roads with like, and the, there was this action of like, you know this phone like i'm looking and trying to like sneak watch you from the other side of the road and we're doing this like mirroring across the thing and then we come together i come out of my military like it's almost like a soldier like kind of like stutter with the body it's a body stutter and i also see everything like a stutter like all the grids they're stuttering if it was a film it would give you epilepsy that's what I want, <laughs> right? So there, there's kind of like a minimal movement, but it's stuck, it's kind of like constricted. So that stutter becomes like this, almost like um, security march. And then I mm. almost get to this point where I have to make way for the other body. And then the music changes, which like a very close friend, Ritz, it's almost like she's adding another layer to the painting when she's adding the sonic element. And that flows into the what I call the flow state, and that's the professional bodies do their thing. I move to the side, and I, I was talking to you, the most crucial point of that performance is the shuffle away, like just move away, or just shut up. Just move yourself away to the margin now, because you have had that, and then you give space to something. Yeah. And actually, weirdly enough, that last summer, I really felt that thing of like, and it is so dramatic, and it feels like it, like where you're old, you realize that you're, to make way, like, like for this generation, you feel, you really feel it. Like you, you know that like there's a switch over, there's like a change, and I, I felt it in the air that year, like 2020, mm. like the everything. I won't even go into it because it's so specific how I identified it, but I really felt it, and it was beautiful. Like you know, it was like coinciding with the whole of the those protests and like yeah, a different like mindset. Yeah, and we we touched about. Um, we touched on radical care as uh, acting within a community, and I think it's also it also has to do with management of space, actually, and taking up space or giving space, and and that movement that you're doing. I mean, this is actually what you're doing is you are giving space um, to other people. So there is also something quite caring about that. But also, like you know, when when you were telling me about. And, and telling us now about how all of this performance is a ritual to kind of exorcise this difficult uh, moment you were in. And that, it really made me think about Leonora Carrington, who was a, a British surrealist artist who lived most of her life in Mexico, but she had really difficult uh, um, experiences. She had, she experienced mental breakdowns in her life. She went through like psychotic episodes. She ended up in a psychiatric hospital where there were experimenting very traumatic methods on her and and her work is just completely out of this world and is and and you can really see that um and she really used it as su such as well actually uh that kind of talismanic essence to them that really helped her to heal and to protect her uh tormented psyche and I feel, yeah, that you can you can see that um, that weight in in the stab vest that you are using um, there. I, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the importance of that in this performative piece. Yeah. So again, at that time, is really weird. I just I felt so scattered in my head, like I couldn't put together like sentences or things. But it, I had 
I had a logic of how to put together form. Mm -hmm. So I actually can show you like how this looked like. So like, I collect these like headline things from the and the those newsstands. I'm really persecuted because I would like change like the words would be like meaning specific really bad things, <laughs> but I don't understand Chinese. These are like holographic yeah. works from my uncle that my mom when she goes to Malaysia. She collects, he's like a, a calligraphy master that does these um, blessings for funerals and weddings. They're so beautiful. Like they're literally like, you know, look at the, the gestures on that. Like they're so fast. Yeah, um, totally. But I, I didn't understand it, but I could just experience it as like pure form. And I knew it's coming from me, from my blood, you know. The front side is like asymmetric writing for my father because he, he almost removed the meaning of it. So it, it, it is purely form. It looks like a rib cage, half a rib cage, that Arabic that he has on the front. So it's like, it's literally like a suturing together of like a person, a body, like your minimal self. This is literally my minimal self. Like I was thinking of like how to dress the other dancers. Like I can't put that writing on them. That's not them. I'd have to find specific stuff from them. So this is like my minimal self, I guess. I see it like that. And weirdly enough, I asked, like, because I don't understand the writing, like, that in Chinese means what, which means I. And I got the person to, that did the score to pick it, and she said, oh, that one, because it looks like it's dancing. And I love that, like, it's however you interpret it, but it turned out to be the perfect word, like, that's me, you know? <laughs> I, the minimal unit of self. Have I lost everyone? Oh dear, we, we, we seem to have lost um, Kareen, but I'm sure she'll come back. Um, uh, where are we? Well, we're coming up to, probably coming up to the point where it'd be nice to sort of um, have some questions anyway from audience yeah. or uh, anyone listening, if you'd like to um, leave questions in the Q&A or the chat. Um, then we can we can pose those uh, to Mandy and um, Kareen. I think was also going to tell us a little bit about some of the work that she's been doing if she if she returns and hopefully she will. Um, but um, I suppose following on, I, I, I was just wondering. You know, you talked, you took us so um, well into sort of the sort of visceral experience of your work and um, its connection to the body. And I was just wondering uh, if you could maybe say a bit more about. Um, uh, scale and texture because you know we're seeing you we're seeing a sort of view into your studio and there's work on the floor on the on the um on the walls and it's sort of really immersive so I wondered you know when you when you're making work oh there you are Kareen I popped I popped my connection dropped <laughs> um, I thought so. I'm really sorry no, and no. you're saying really fascinating um things <laughs> Mandy uh, about about all of these uh, inscriptions that you were collecting mm. and how it related to your blood in a way as well but I was thinking now we're, we're, we're like 10 minutes um, yeah no yeah because I wasn't sure what, um, whether whether we'd get yeah. you back and I hope we would so I'm glad you're, you're there but yeah I was thinking maybe we could move to questions a bit yeah. but if you want to do you want to just finish off what you were saying if you want to to just wrap up that now and then we can have time for a few questions or um, yeah, please, Mandy, if you if you want to like tell it, I, I mean, I'm sorry because it just cut and I was. <laughs> I know. You, so if you if you want to like yeah, finish what you were saying, um, and then we can just know, open to questions. So, I think. Yeah, let's let's just leave the questions. I'll follow uh, Claudia's pathway. So yeah, well, I was so just I was I was sort of rambling on, but but thinking about scale and texture and. Just wondering, maybe if you could tell us a bit more about the, the making pro sort of where you situate yourself physically when you're making, because we're seeing some works on the floor and on the walls, and there just seems to be, um, you know, such a such an emphasis on the body and the body mm. being within the work itself. Mm. Um, so, and and I was interested also hearing about, you know, your 
um, sort of preparation, preparation for painting through dance or through kind of waking up the body. And that just seemed yeah. really interesting. Waking up is really good because sometimes it takes a while to wake up and I'm like, mm -hmm. when am I going to feel the thing? Because as another artist said, you have to feel warm about yourself to start the flow, start to get into the flow state. You can't be bitty, you can't, but you have to go in and be warm with yourself. So sometimes that takes a while if you just come from another context. But I think it's really important to see, and that's why like, I, I like students to see the studio, you know, because I think there's this thing that some artists are really open with their space and some like are really secretive and we just see the end product. But actually the process is the most important. And it's like, I, I don't want to ever be secretive about it. Like it is the work, the process is the work. So like, if you can do a little, I don't know if you can see. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. So it's everything is made on the floor. Um, and if it's only stapled to the walls for like, for efficiency, because there's not much room. So once it's like drying, it go on the wall. But everything is on the floor. So I'm always above. You see me? Yeah, I'm yeah. Like, oh, no, I'm going to get my socks. <laughs> like either crouching or if I'm like in a sailing place or standing. So there's this kind of like immersion even with my vision. So I don't, I am not judging it aesthetically. I am not trying to find or make anything. I'm just making a mess. And I always think this is like important even for children when they're like um, drawing because they're always like they, they want to adhere to a certain form and actually if you keep it as formless as possible for the longest amount of time you'll, you'll get just like more interesting things like instead of like a little house and trees and the sun goes over there like to be in a space where you're not judging or making anything at all you're just letting your body show you at the end so when I have this vision I'm just creating like just going off a procedure let's say and then when I put it on the wall then or when I put it upright or when I step back, then I can see what I've done. Like everything else, like the, the word work, like the performance, like putting it all together, like in a very methodical way, but then um, not judging it or not like just going very, what's the word, arbitrary through the process. In that way, that's automatism, I guess, I see it. Mm. Not, not compositional. So that, yeah, that relationship is a form of immersion, like where I'm like sandwiching my body in there. Um, scale wise, I was asking, I guess I want the engulfment of the figure. So like there are size where it's like you have to really, really step back. And when you step close that you're in it, when you're close to it, you're in it. And then you're having a different relationship, which is one of like searching or inspecting the fragments like forensically. So you have a choice of like, of, of beholding the work in different ways. And, and does that continue through to, because I was just thinking of some, you know, some of the installation shots I'd seen of, of your exhibitions and, and that carries through, I imagine, to what you hope for the, for the viewer to encounter or the way that they move through and around your work. Um, that's the case, yeah. Hmm. So I, oh, I want to reverse that kind of relationship with that kind of white space and then the yeah. objects are the thing. I want you to be totally engulfed and mm -hmm. when you see an empty space, you feel that more than the things. So the things feel natural, like environmental, like inner space, let's mm -hmm. say, as you move through the exhibition. Yeah. yeah. And you were telling, um, you were talking about as well about that covering of everything, of the walls, etc., as an antithesis to the white cube and as a kind of way of recuperating histories. I was wondering if you could tell, tell us about that as well. Um, yeah, it actually just comes from a discomfort. Like I was saying how I like, you know, a lot of artists do it. They save the place before they start an install, you know, because they want to make it, again, want to feel warm. Like, and the, there is a violence in that blankness that we talked about. And I believe that whiteness, and I think a lot of theorists have uh, posited this as a neutral space in many different fields is a construction built over different historical processes to create this the space that everything gains its meaning from. So if you think about that in those terms and you translate that materially, I see that as sedimentation. I see that as a build up of matter. And it's literally like, you know, covering it with white stuff. 
you know? So, and everything embedded in between to get to that place of like clean, let's say, you know? Yeah. So this impasto of things is, is like speaking, speaking to that historical buildup. Um, we haven't just arrived here as an objective given. Shall we read this chat? Yeah, yeah, I was just looking at that because I was thinking about, you know, where drawing and writing meet and different different elements of your practice. And someone's asked that in um, a really um, interesting way. Um, I'll read it out because there's sort of different parts to it and you might want to kind of touch yeah. on different parts. But um, so the question is, how would, um, how would you describe the relationship between drawing, painting, calligraphy and language? It's interesting what you struggle to call your, um, it's interesting that you struggle to call yourself a painter while speaking English, we differentiate drawing from painting, but this distinction doesn't exist in some other languages. Would you say painting and drawing with your body is almost a metaphor of inventing at the same time as learning a language? I, I just agree with all of that. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, even with the calligraphy, like there's an illegibility to my reception of it because I, you know, spoke Arabic briefly when I was a kid and then lost it, then tried to, I went to like Sunday Chinese school and then it didn't stick. So there's a broken syntax to my putting together of stuff as with many things. So I behold it as like gesture, I behold it as like form and, 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 and painting. So again, I see everything as a spectrum, every single thing. So drawing, painting, like that's a distinction that other people have. And I can use that strategically in specific ways, but I don't see the difference. Just as like, when does speaking become poetry, become singing, become music? Like, you know, so I uh, agree that the body I'm trying to kind of find through doing what my rhythm looks like, because I feel it. Um, and everyone has a signature rhythm in their body. Everyone has their own little wriggle, as I call it. So I, I'm trying to like record it and find out what that is and what it looks like. It's always a bit shaky, I've noticed. And when I'm really ill, I get super shaky, even with my writing. Like it's good to see a diary of like how, I know I'm going to a bad place because like my M's need legs because they're, they, they're like really broken. <laughs> Great, no, thank you for that. Yeah, it was, it was making me think also of, um, there's a, on one of the courses at the drawing school, um, uh, there's a, they, they use um, the Laban dance technique or dance movement technique in, as a way of kind of warming up for drawing and of sort of feeling one's way into different parts of the body. Um, so being really awake, you know, at the ends of the fingers, at the ends of the, at the back of the head. Can you demonstrate? Sorry. <laughs> How does that look like? Well, um, I mean, uh, it's not it's not like a, a choreographed dance, but it's more like warm. It's sort of warm up exercises. I probably can't explain it that way, but Laban, um, Laban's whole sort of technique, um, and there's a sort of set of different exercises that are used. But um, you and Clayton is um, the tutor who who's kind of introduced it, and it's just a really interesting way of um, waking up the body for drawing um, different parts of. I suppose of the kind of physical, mm. um, sort of physical relationship to drawing. Mm. And they have that in singing, right? Where you have to mm. do yeah. the nails, all those weird noises. Yeah. Like, that are all over the top. yeah. I guess we don't think of drawing in, in that way, which is a shame, which is why like, there's this kind of like constipation with like painting more, because you have this expectation that is a blank canvas. Again, thinking about this thing. And so drawings aren't, a more liberated action let's say because if you don't expect anything and you just are in your body and just get feel one with that then stuff can flow out nicely mm -hmm. yeah it's partly about freedom and sort of yeah making out the intuitive um yeah great um, are there any other questions have a look from the um, participants. I know someone's asked just about um, whether the recording will be shared and yeah you can um, lots of people like to listen again or, or listen you know at different times so um, so yes it will be recorded and we'll put it um, uh, online in the sort of lectures part of the website of, of the drawing school website so you can revisit that.
um, uh, as and when you'd like to. Um, another question. Oh, so to follow on, uh, Judith, yeah, um, um, he's saying that um, in calligraphy we actually draw characters, but this is called writing in Chinese. I'm just wondering what gesture means for you. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really important to ask what these simple words mean to you. Like what love means to one person, we use this like word all the time. It's so, so different for each person. So um, gesture means to me something that doesn't hold meaning necessarily, but it's just an action, um, gestural. So, but again, you have asemic writing, which is writing that doesn't have meaning. So again, it's about that spectrum of when does it become drawing or writing, what is writing? And that's a whole philosophical question. And I think even my fracture from my mother tongues or father tongues makes it uncomfortable to, to define where that starts or ends because it actually embedded there some memory of it. So it's just like there's moments of recognition as well. So there's that partially like legibility or something like that. So, um, and I just, started working with um, a Chinese lady with, that um, was telling me what these characters are and how languages function so differently, like certain characters together because it's a pictographic um, language, Chinese, um, are actual particular scenes of particular landscapes and particular Chinese culture. Like it's not just like springtime, it's like this kind of scenery at this specific in this specific context so and and you it's not separable from an image so again like what is image and text so uh, yeah it's hard to, to define really I'm using it very loosely and watery mm. amanda um, oh yeah got appreciative comments about um the openness <laughs> The openness of your your conversation together and I, I would um, yeah second that um, no, it's been really it's been a really fascinating conversation and I know we, we sort of time is slipping away now so we we, we have to draw to a close but um we, we'll look forward to um, I think it's next year isn't it your um, your works in the British art show the touring show is there anything else is there anywhere else that people can look to to kind of follow your work um, um, oh, we've got what, my, my head is in a really funny place right now. So there's there's so many things. I think I'm thinking yeah. about uh, thing in um, Paris. <laughs> um, lots but, going on. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm sure if we um, yeah we can we can highlight your your you you know what you're what you're going on to do um, in our in our own um, social media or newsletters or whatever we can. Be I, I've just seen this, there's a last question I feel we should um, uh, we should touch on because it, it also I was thinking also about um, sort of text and um, collage and, and um, there's a last question here about um, when you bring in newspapers and magazines in your work would you say you select them consciously or randomly you've talked quite a bit about the unconscious together yeah. haven't you and um, yeah. so maybe we can go back to Corinne's point about like what's the relationship with the unconscious in the work and mm. um, automatism autom how do you say the word automatism <laughs> so I think it's the, it's again there's no there isn't a separable definition for when it when it's like conscious or unconscious there's this word or this term called arbitrary contingent and in in Lacanian term, terminology so that essentially means like so I'm picking things up not thinking too much, but it's specific to me. So it's both arbitrary and random, but specific to me. So arbitrary contingent, specific to the person that's doing it, but the action is to me arbitrary. And that does this re retroactive kind of re revealing where I can see at the end what like my signifiers are, what my sticking points are. There's certain forms that continue come up like this green always comes up this hospital green or like these specific words and they have near logistic kind of um strength in my discourse of self and his personal history but someone else is going to read that differently and me and um kareen were talking about this relationship in the too muchness of a hang or like i'm a maximalist so any hang i do will have loads of stuff and I would always get the question, like, what are you trying to say with these words put together? It's like, look around, there's so many words, like there's 
you will see what you have picked up on. I can't tell you what your translation is. So the best I can answer that question is like, I pick up things I'm attracted to. I don't question too much why. I don't um, narrativize an explanation. And I like to keep that space kind of like fluid. I don't want to like pin it down, but I, I know there's repetition, put it that way. But great question. Great, great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you both. It's been, yeah, such a, such a wide ranging um, exploration and really sort of searching exploration. So lots of um, appreciation um, uh, from our, from everyone listening to, um, to you. And I've just seen as a note um, that you've got an exhibition at ROPAC opening on the 24th of November. Is, is that right? So, so that's something for us to um, all look to and look forward to. And Kareen, thank you so much for your for your conversation too. And, and I'm glad we got you back at the end there. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry about all the, yeah. No, all the no, no. no, it's all good. Good to have you back. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you for your conversation. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so Thanks much. So thank you, Claudia and Mandy.